it's Kristen, and you are listening to this week's episode of Conversations on the Rocks, the show that's like your favorite drink, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a whole lot of unexpected twists. And I've got my first repeat guest, Gerilyn Kelly, who was with me in the very beginning, and we are going to talk about our favorite subject again. We're going to talk about dogs. But this time we are going to really niche it down and we're going to talk about working dogs. Although my dogs don't work, they just work <laughs> at laying around. Um, but it kind of stemmed when we were talking about um, the misuse or abuse of people with emotional support dogs. And so we're dedicating the next 30 minutes to your expertise on um working dogs, what they are, what they really are, when they're not. And I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. So I thought we start at the bottom, which is the easiest dog to talk about. And that's the therapy dog. So I always get phone calls from people that say they want to get a therapy dog um, for their children. And I'm, you know, it's, it's like you, you don't need a therapy dog for your children. So a therapy dog is someone's pet. They okay. volunteer their time with their pe with their handler, whether you know whoever it is, and they visit nursing homes, hospitals, um, and things like that. They need training for that. So a lot of people, I, I have heard people, especially in the area, there's nursing homes that if you have your canine good citizen certificate, which is a AKC sanctioned test, um, if you're able to pass that you can come to their nursing home with just your vaccination records. And what kind of test is that? What, is, what does it take to become an, a canine good citizen? Yeah. It's 10 canine tasks. Good. Look, my hands look so big. <laughs> 10 <laughs> tasks. Um, and if they've, they've had training, it should be a no-brainer for them. So the, it's different now because of COVID, but the, there's 10 tasks. They have to pass all 10. Greeting a friendly stranger, somebody walks up that they don't know and ha um, shakes their handler's hand. May I pet your dog? Getting pet and then grooming and appearance. So they have to be clean. Their nails have to be cut. Their ears have to be clean. They can't be matted. You know, basically straight from the groomer. And then you have your simples. Sit, down, stay, come, uh, walking on a leash, walking through a crowd, greeting another dog, reaction to a distraction. And then the last one is the toughest one for them. They have to stay with a stranger for three minutes without their owners in the room or within hearing distance. Okay. So that's the toughest for them, especially if they're like Velcro dogs. Um, you know, they get very stressed out and very nervous. So if they can pass that test, they're generally well behaved. You know, that owner has taken the time out and done the work. And but you offer you, that in uh, Elite, Elite Canine. You have a class for that. That's what I thought. I do. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you have to be an evaluator through the AKC. I think I became an evaluator in 2006. You have to have two years. Well, you did that. And you have to have two years of experience of training. Um, and so it, if you walk into a nursing home with just your canine good citizen, you're not insured. So if something were to happen. They're not going to come after you. So that's why you go with an organization. That's why you, you know, sign up with, and there's tons of them. There's Therapy Dog International. You have Pet Partners. There's Love on a Leash. Um, uh, Pet Alliance. There's a whole ton of them. There's a whole handful of them. And then, of course, I have my own team. And so they're insured through my business. So anytime they do something for Elite Canine, they're insured. Okay. So, um, but... They have to be trained. You can't have a dog that's out of control in a nursing home because they're right. going to knock somebody down. They right. can't be a barker. They can't be dragging their owner down the hallway. So there is a lot of training that goes into it. Um, and, you know, you have your membership fees. Um, I, I don't charge a membership fee because I have insurance anyway for my business. So it doesn't really matter to me. And these guys are volunteering their time. So I don't really care about them paying me. Um, they just have to have a T-shirt just so that they're represented right. um, and they have, you know, when they go out and, you know, every facility for the most part wants their shot records on file. Sometimes they ask me for an insurance, um, um, you know, a copy of my insurance, which is fine. And, you know, they, they can do basically any kind of volunteer work. So Art, can you see him? Yeah. Our team does a lot of stuff outside of the, 
not the norm, but we do a lot of events. We work very closely with the sheriff's department. Um, you know, we do that every time I lose a student to some disease, I join in that. So we do the ALS walk. We've done some cancer walks. Um, and then of course the suicide prevention walk because Lord knows how many friends I've lost to that. So, right. you know, they do a lot of stuff, um, outside of the nursing homes. You know, Ronald McDonald House, hospice, which is a really tough visit. And then the SCCU Family House. So they do a lot of stuff, these guys. Um, they're an amazing group of people. I, I couldn't ask for a better group of people. They're so dedicated. So therapy dogs require testing. And they really do require being registered with a therapy organization so that they're insured. So okay. that's a therapy dog. As far as rights go, none. This is your pet that you're taking out to do a visit with somebody. That's it. Above that is your ESA or your emotional support animal. Now, according to the ADA laws, an emotional support animal can be a dog, a cat, or a miniature horse. So, mm -hmm. so unfortunately, when ESAs were first introduced, there was no like written what it could be. So you had people bringing snakes squirrels, monkeys, um, someone brought a rooster on a plane. So they were really taking it to the extreme because there was nothing in the ADA laws that said it's strictly these things right, or these types of animals. So they really ruined it for everybody in plain English. So when you have an emotional support animal, you fall under two ADA laws. Number one, you can live somewhere where there's no pets allowed as long as you have a note from a mental health care provider like a prescription okay but that doesn't count for everybody like a airbnb doesn't have to let you stay there um a privately rented home doesn't have to let you stay there like there's there's these little tweaks in the law that you really have to read about um and then they used to be able to fly but they don't let them fly anymore because those people have destroyed it or the dogs aren't um, trained because they don't have to be trained. And ESA is your pet that helps you. That's it. Right. So there's no training required. Um, there's no registration required. So when you see on social media, all of those posts that go up and down all day, $165 and we'll send you your ID card, your certificate, um, you know, there's no such thing as that. We'll register you with North Carolina or we'll register you with the country. There is no registration required whatsoever for an emotional support animal. None. They are your pet that help you with anxiety, depression, panic attacks, things like that. Um, so when did the, be, because this, we've talked about this, it might've been either in a conversation or the last time, when did that go into effect that they couldn't, because you told me that the last time we talked about the, you know, ESAs can't fly anymore because everybody abused the system. Um, I was just on a flight and there was a dog, but I don't know if he was ESA. He could have been. How big was he? Uh, he was, he was going to be big because he was, he looked like he was like a six month lab puppy. Um, and this so was just a couple of weeks ago. That could have been a puppy nanny. So the breeders have puppy nannies. So if the dogs are big enough to go under the seat, they can fly. Even an older dog, like a Yorkie or a little, little tiny poodle, they can fly with you in the cabin if their crate fits under the seat. But the puppy nannies come from all over the country and deliver the puppies from these breeders. Wait. So this is an actual job. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. I wait. How do You're I to fly. get this job? Yeah, yeah. So puppy nannies are a big thing now. Um, and, and I guess need this job. Mm -hmm. Puppy nanny. Yeah. So um, that could have been a puppy nanny, or that could have been somebody who flew out to get their puppy and was flying home. But as long as they're small enough, they can be in the cabin with you. Okay. Um, but the ESA went into effect. I want to say pre-COVID. Because oh. of the man who brought the snake on the plane, I believe that was the last resort. And this is not a federal law. This is the FAA. Okay. This is, they have their own set of rules, the FAA. So they said no more. And then there was the guy who was renting an apartment and they said, we're sorry, you can't have a pet squirrel. And he said, oh, no, no, he's my ESA. <laughs> he had a pet squirrel. And the rooster. I remember the rooster. Yeah. And the rooster. So there's a lot of stuff 
you know, people take advantage, unfortunately, Absolutely. and then it ruins it for the people who actually really needed ESA on a flight. Um, so, yeah, so that's an ESA. Again, no training is required whatsoever. No registration is required at all. Nothing. They don't have to wear anything. They don't need an ID card. They're basically for you at home. That's okay. it. So I use Colt as an ESA because I have a panic. I have panic attacks. Sure. Um, now all four of them will come up on the bed with me. So <laughs> I have like four, um, but I can't take him anywhere. He can't go into a restaurant. He can't go into the mall. He can't, he can't go anywhere unless I rent from someone and I have a, a, a letter from a mental health care provider. That's it. So ESAs are not supposed to be able to go into uh, any place, correct? No. Only and if they're they dog do. friendly. Oh yeah. And they do. So, I mean, yeah. and, <laughs> and that stems from the top of the tier, the service dog. So service dogs are by definition is a dog that provides a service. You're blind. They help you walk. They help you find things. You're deaf. Um, that's an alert service dog. So I trained Romeo. Oh my God. So many years ago, it has to be at least, well, at least 20 years ago, maybe 19. And Romeo was this little tiny Chihuahua mix and his mom was deaf. And so she wanted to live on her own. She was living with her mom and she said, I want to live on my own, but my mother's afraid. So we had this line of touch lamps and they all had a different color bulb in them. And when we made a sound like, um, uh, like the, uh, beep, beep, beep of the smoke detector, Romeo knew to hit the red light and the red okay. light would come on. So she could see the light as opposed to hearing it. But because she spoke so differently than I did. So I say sit where she said, Dit. she did all the training. Oh, wow. I never asked that dog to sit or lay down or touch or anything because my verbiage was different than hers. Sure. So she did every single thing. Um, and Romeo was a perfect dog. I mean, he was a great, great service dog. So deaf, blind, diabetic. Now, diabetic. Here's another issue, another problem. There is a trainer in Virginia. There's one in Charlotte, both with a mound of lawsuits on them. Diabetic detection is a very specialized service dog training. When you're diabetic, your body, mostly through your mouth, releases a smell that the dogs can smell. They say it smells like Fruit Loops. So the way a diabetic detection dog is trained, they're trained by somebody for the most part who is diabetic. Okay. And they themselves allow their sugar numbers to go up and down in a controlled way so that the dog knows what to look for. Mm -hmm. So there, those two kennels um, released dogs that were not trained and someone almost died from a diabetic coma because the dog didn't alert. The one in Charlotte sold someone here local $35,000. Her, her son um, was autistic. And so they wanted to train him to boundary him in the yard. So if he tried to get out of the yard, the dog would block him so that he right. couldn't go out of the yard. Well, he was in the yard with the dog on a leash. He went up the back steps and fell down into a seizure. And he let go of the leash and the dog ran away. Oh, <gasps> So when you have your, you know, they're not detecting a seizure. They're detecting the different um, vibes coming from your body, your heart uh -huh. rate, things like that. These are specialized trainers. So when I see local trainers that are like, oh, I do diabetic training. I'm like, are you sure you do diabetic training? You know, I'm not saying that they don't. Maybe they do. But it's such a specialized training that you're dealing with someone's life. Right. So people call me all the time and I'm like, I don't do that. I don't do any kind of life-saving service dog training. Um, so deaf, blind, diabetic, seizure. And then you do have your, of course, your PTSD dogs. And these dogs are amazing. I mean, they're amazing. Um, usually a soldier will have them. Um, and I saw one in Walmart one time. The, it was a German Shepherd and he was online. The guy was online and the dog did a constant rotation around him so nobody could get close. And every time the guy moved up, the dog shifted forward. Wow. So he created this barrier. Because you know, sometimes you're online and people are like, 
Yeah. And you're like, I can smell your breath. Can you back up? So yeah. this dog eliminates that. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And just a constant circling while the guy was online. It was amazing for me to watch it. Um, and of course, you know, you have your dogs that will get your medication, things that drop on the ground. So someone who's paralyzed can use a service dog. So they have to physically do something for their human. And that's where people don't understand. And they want a dog. They want their dog to go everywhere with them. If I'm eating at a restaurant, I don't want to know what Colt is doing. I'm no. relaxing with my friends and I'm eating. I don't want to be worried about him whining or getting up or, you know, trying to go over to say hello to somebody. He doesn't need to be in the grocery store with me. No. He doesn't need to be, you know, ev I don't want to take him everywhere with me. He doesn't need to go to certain no. places. So service dogs, fake service dogs, I can usually point them out. You have the little chihuahua in the basket in the grocery store with the lady on the electric wheelchair. That most likely is not a service dog. Right. What is that little dog doing? You right. know what I mean? Like, what is that little dog doing? Yeah. Right. So when you look at the American Disabilities Act, unfortunately, it needs to be rewritten. It pretty much needs to be rewritten. A service dog does not have to have a vest on. So they don't have to have any identification on them, nothing. There's no service dog registration. So again, when you see those NC service dog register or you see a trainer that says, we'll help you register your dog, there's no such thing. Anybody can say their dog is a service dog. So when people walk into the grocery store, no one's gonna question them because they're afraid they're going to get sued. Right. So you can ask a service dog owner two questions or handler. Is that a service dog? And if yes, what kind of service does it provide? Not what kind of ailment do you have? Just what does the dog do for you? Right. You can ask those two questions. Other than that, you can't ask them anything else. And if they say, yes, it's a service dog and give you some kind of ailment, who are you to say that that's not the case? Because someone who has diabetes, may not look like they have diabetes right? or seizure disorder. You can't tell that someone who's deaf, unless you're actually talking to them, you know, with sign language or they can read your lips. You don't know that they're deaf. And if you say, no, you can't come in here. And that dog happens to be a real service dog. You're done that they will sue you so fast and they will always win. So it is kind of tough for these businesses, businesses because they're afraid. Sure. So a service dog can go anywhere their owner goes, except an operating room because of the sterile surroundings. So anywhere they go, they can take them. Plane, boat, taxi, you know, Uber, anything like that, they can go with them. But again, they don't have any kind of, they don't have to have any kind of identification on them. So when it comes to, we'll go back to the PTSD, you know, because it's German Shepherd and, you know, I have a, 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 a soft spot for those, but they're mm -hmm. big dogs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the airplanes. Do they, and they're not fitting underneath the seat, especially the way, no. the way airplanes are built now. Do they, do you have, did they have to buy a seat for the dog? I mean, no, the dog lays on the floor underneath their feet. Okay. So when you have a service dog, if they're properly trained, you should never know they're there. Absolutely. So I was at Milner's, this was a few years ago, and there was a uh, two couples sitting next to me, a little bit older than us, and um, I was there with Jenny and Marwan, and what is that? You made some kind of hand gesture that gave a thumbs up. <laughs> oh, wow, that was weird. Okay, so they were sitting, I mean, they were like eating when we sat down, and so we're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, they all get up, and I see this little dog, and I was like, oh. <gasps> There is a dog under the table. So I said to Jenny, that's a nicely well-trained service dog. So I said, I'm sorry, I have to go tell them. So I went out and I caught them outside in the front. And I said, I just want to say how wonderful it was that I had no idea your dog was under there. And I said who I was, you know, and what I do for a living and why I wasn't just some weirdo running up on them. And they said, oh, yeah, you'll, you'd never know she was anywhere that we are. So when they're out, if you see a dog with a service dog vest on sitting in the chair or in a booth next to the owner, that's not a service dog. They have to bad. be on the floor. They have to be walking. They have to be on a leash. They can't be reactive. 
They're not allowed to growl at other dogs. They're basically trained to never really take their eyes off of you. Their right, job that's their job. To protect you. Right. So I was amazed by this little dog. I mean, just beautifully behaved. To me, that's a service dog. Yeah. Yeah. And I really started seeing the abuse of the system last year um, when I was down in Florida and we were at a restaurant and there was a woman who unfortunately was in our group who had this big old Labradoodle and it's always a Labradoodle, always a Labradoodle that um, was, there was a table next to us where so we had a long table of like eight of us and there was a booth behind us with a couple. And all of a sudden I hear this woman going, ma'am ma'am, you need to curb your dog. And, you know, the whole time, you know, this girl is going, oh, it's my ESA. It's my ESA. It's my therapy dog. And I'm like, um, no, it's not. I mean, it's just the blatant lie. I mean, mm -hmm. because they're not going to get up and walk around. Even I know that. And I am no expert. You know, it's the same thing. I told you about the story out in San Diego last year with, you know, sitting at the outside bar mm -hmm. and there was the cutest little dog sitting right in front of me, but he had his work shirt on quote unquote. And so, I mean, I wanted to like get up there and like wrestle with him. And, but I was like, Nope, he's working because if you don't know that you do not, they're not your pet. They're not to be petted. They're working. It's like a canine. And all of a sudden this one other lady comes up by us. And she's like, I know he's working. I know it's a service dog, but can I pet it? And she's like, oh, I just bought that for him. He's not really a service dog. I almost lost my mind. I was mm -hmm. like, are you effing kidding me? Yeah. You are the problem. And it's an ethical thing. Yeah, too. I mean, and when people call me and I say, what is, what does a dog need to do for you? What is the medical condition that you need the dog to be your service dog for? If they say, I just want to bring my dog everywhere. My response is you should be thanking your lucky stars that you don't need a service dog mm -hmm. because that means you have something pretty desperately wrong with you. You know, whether it's a, um, you know, uh, diabetes, I mean, that's diabetes is can be fatal if you go into a coma and the person who really needs the dog now is having trouble because you think it's okay for you to claim that your dog is a service right. dog. Right. Yeah. And then you have the, the videos of the, um, in the mall with the kids. Did you ever see that? It was uh -uh. all the service dogs in training. Cause in North Carolina, I, I don't think it was here, but in North Carolina and some other States, you can use everywhere for training. So if you're a trainer and you're training a service dog and it says service dog in training on their vest, you can go into these stores. You're allowed to do that, even though they're not fully trained yet, because how else are you going to train them? If right. You don't go in the grocery store and things right. like that. Right. So North Carolina does allow you to do that. And some of the other states do. So they were in the mall and they were all lined up. There was maybe five or six of them. This lady walked by with her kids and the kids wanted to pet the dogs. And the owner said, and the handler was like, no, no, they're service dogs. They're in training. You're going to deny my kid. What do you mean? They can't pet them. They're dog. She was screaming at these people because they wouldn't let her daughter pet the dog. Like, I wish I had been there. I wish I had been there because I would have definitely opened my mouth. Right. But yeah, I mean, uh, and, and you know, just for your audience, if a service dog ever approaches you without a handler, you need to follow that dog because their handler is hurt. That mm -hmm. is great advice. Say that yep. again. So if you ever come across a service dog without their handler attached, you need to follow that dog. It will take you to the handler. They're trained. Um, yeah, they're trained to do that. So like if you're in the grocery store and a dog just comes up to you with a service dog vest on with their leash dragging, their owner is somewhere in the store. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, and don't, don't touch not, a service dog. You just don't yeah. touch a service dog. Plain well, it's like you wouldn't touch a canine. You know, you wouldn't, right. you know, if you ran into the sheriff's puppy, office, puppy. Exactly. I'm like, they're working, <laughs> right. you know, I always just look from, from afar and just kind of go like, boy, I sure wish I could, but you're working, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. like, you're a good working dog. Um, and they're not cheap. Talk about the cost of, um, service dogs. So there are certain, comp uh, bis um, not businesses, organizations out there that you can get a service dog for free. So you have Canine Companions for Independence, if I'm not mistaken, um, their service dogs are free, but there's a very long waiting list for them. Um, but you're talking between thirty-five and $50,000 for a dog. And a lot of them 
you have to go to where they are. So there's a great um, documentary on Netflix called Dogs. And the very first one takes you through all the steps of this autistic young man getting a dog. So he had to go to the facility. They had to like live in the state for a little while. And they had to work him in because the dog needs a connection for that sort of service work. And if the dog didn't connect with this child, they had to start fresh with a different dog. Wow. Yeah. And then you have your dogs that fail. You know, so those, they usually go up for adoption. The handlers usually keep them, the, the trainers. So when you have these service dogs, especially canines for um, um, uh, companion canines for independence or canine companions for independence, they have puppy handlers for the first 18 months of their life. So you get this little, they're usually golden and lab mixes um, at like 10 or 12 weeks. And you start them with their training. And I've had a couple CCI dogs in my class and they're just, oh my God, they're so cute. But the very first one I had when I moved here, because there's a CCI in Charlotte, um, was this older gentleman and he had this little puppy and oh my God, he was so cute. But they were doing the jerk training, like the jerk this. And they sent me like a list of all of the things. So when he would turn, in a heel, it wasn't left, it was left, left, right, right. He had to double everything up because if he's walking and somebody says, hey, where's blah, 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 and that blind person says, oh, they just left, and that dog turns, it's going to trip the person because that person's not. Right, so they had to double up on everything. So I was like, that's not a problem. We can do that. But everybody else in the class was using positive reinforcement with the clicker. And so he came to me and he was like, I don't feel comfortable. It was his first dog. I don't feel comfortable using, you know, that choke chain to jerk him. I said, I'm sorry, but that's what CCI wants you to use. So it's not for me to say that you can't use that. So he called CCI and they were like, well, when they come back here, the clicker is introduced. So you can just introduce it now. But he was so sad that he had to do this to this little puppy that, you know, he convinced CCI to go against their training so that he could train them with a positive reinforcement technique. Um, yeah. And then I had someone else. I can't remember. I just actually, the video just went by. The dog was healing in the Mass General store. I can't remember her name. I can't remember her name. Um, but I had a few clients who had failed service dogs. You know, they just don't have what it takes, which is fine. Right. You know, I mean, not every dog is built for work. Right. Yeah. So you said labs. Is that the most common um, service dog? Lab golden mixes. Yeah. Yeah. And they start them at four weeks. They start their training at four weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. They don't even have a chance to be puppies. <laughs> I know. I know. And, you know, it's, it's, I have seen people with service dogs that aren't nice to their service dogs, which is very sad to me. Um, they basically treat them like just a worker, like an employee. Um, but for the most part, like if you go to Tucker's, you'll see service dogs running around because their owners want them to be dogs too. Oh, yeah. And when they take the vest off, they know they're not working. Again, like canines. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they have their uniform. They know. Right. I mean, any any TikTok I've ever watched or even, you know, any demonstrations from uh, Fisco, it's um, they when that harness comes out, they know it's time to get to work and it comes off mm -hmm. and they derfs. <laughs> they get to right. be, they get to be dogs. Right. Is it, it to me, I get that and I, I and I that's a wonderful thing, but God forbid that person has an episode. That dog's not right there. Oh, that's a good so point. So that does make me a little bit nervous. Like having them in your home with the vest off because, you know, they're right there. Um, but like in a yard, like a dog park and stuff, I mean, that dog could be all the way across the the dog park and you go into a throes of a seizure. You could have been warned to lay down if you were standing up. Or So some of it I'm not a big fan of. Um, definitely at home, though. Definitely at home. You know, because you're right there with them. So if you were to have a problem, they're going to sense it because they're so close to you. But yeah, don't touch service dogs, folks. Plain and simple. The person's not being mean and they're not being mean to the dog. They're just not supposed to be touched. Mm -hmm. And if you're walking by a service dog with your own dog, make some room so that your dog doesn't go over to that dog. They don't meet, need to be distracted away from their owners. Right. Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously, if it was Colt, he'd be like, you know, to the service dog. So they don't need that either. 
He's Maybe. like, dude, I'm just just trying to do my job. Why are you gonna be right, so mean? Right. <laughs> I don't see you. I don't see you. Right. So <laughs> um all right, well that's cool. Wow, I learned a lot. I always learn a lot when I talk to you. Anything <laughs> anything in closing you want to share about um, how can we how can we stop these posers, man? I mean, unless the federal government goes in and makes the laws stricter, there's not really anything we can do about it. Um, but if you need information about how to get a service dog or what the things are needed or, you know, you need to have some questions about the ADA laws, feel free to call me. I mean, I'm very well versed in them and, and they haven't changed in many, many years. So, um, but yeah. If you see a service dog, stay away from them. If you have an ESA, you can't take them everywhere. And people, stop taking your dogs everywhere anyhow. I love my dogs. Gerilyn loves her dogs. Mm-hmm. We don't, it's it's kind of like when with when with kids. I didn't want to take my kids everywhere all the time. Let me go out and have a good time. Let me be like, and now it's like I'm the same way. It's like I wouldn't dream of, t- and it bothers me. It really does bother me. And I'm a dog lover. It really <laughs> bugs the crap out of me. It's like... Right. Well, I mean, what bothers me is like, if I'm in a brewery and I see someone's dog walking around without a leash on, this is not your home. Put your dog on a leash. There's a leash law. The dogs, it says it right on the front door. Your dogs have to be leashed. If your dog is being a jerk, take them home and don't bring them there again. Like I don't bring Colt to the breweries. Because I know that he's not great on a leash and he's going to be growly. So I don't take him when I go to the breweries. I know I wish I could, but I don't, you know. Um, if your dog is incessantly barking, take him home. I don't want to listen to that. Right. You know, so, and if they're under the table and they don't like to be touched because they're shy, that's great. That's fine. I mean, that, whatever. You know, if I don't even hear them or know that they're there, whatever but I don't want your dog coming up to me off leash. I will pet it, but I'll be annoyed. And I will say, you really need to put your dog on a leash, you know, because it's dangerous. It is. Um, Yeah. So like if I had walked in like joy mongers, there was these, this guy, um, he had two dogs. I won't say what kind of dogs are because I don't want to call anybody out, but, and they were both off leash. If I had walked in the door with Colt and they had come over, Colt's on a leash, but he's the threat. So even though, you know, your dogs are friendly and you think that it's not a big deal because maybe somebody else's dog is on a leash, they approach Colt, we're going to have an altercation. So it's a, it's a safety measure for both your dog and the other dog. Well, and that whole, we've talked about that too. It's kind of off topic, but at the same, it's like people like will let their dogs run over. And like when Mackenzie's dog was here, Luna, Luna was very protective of Josie. And they're like, oh, don't worry. They're friendly. I'm like, yeah, but she's an asshole. Right. Right. They're friendly. Okay. But mine's not. Exactly. Right. And so I don't want to have to deal with, you know, because she was a part, you know, she was part pit bull and so strong i'm like now you're ruining it for me because now i'm gonna have to pull this dog off and to keep her from you know charging at your friendly little dog right and then it's gonna be oh look at the vicious pit bull oh my god it's always a pit bull right and when all it was was luna just being protective of josie right right because you know josie can't defend herself being bigger (laughs) than all those dogs right right Yeah. Gerilyn, it's always so much fun. We'll have to think of another topic. Okay. <laughs> and do this yeah. again because it's always fun. Even when we have some major disco echoing going on in the beginning. Next yeah, time we'll have the great. beatbox. So yeah, do the cabbage patch for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, everybody. Until next time, may your cups be full, your mind be open, and your heart full of kindness because we're all battling something. Till next time. As the saying goes, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And that's a wrap for this week's episode. A big thanks to my guests for sharing their story and to you for listening. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and spread the words. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, the link is in the show notes. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers.